So our next speaker would be Steve. Um, he's talking about the shadows and how they work and what it's all about. Um, Steve is a, actually a great speaker in, in the sense that um, he brings things to the basics, to the everyday language that we all can, can really easily comprehend. And I'm um, looking forward to this one, actually, because um, there's still a lot of people that don't know what shadow work is. And so it would be good that um, Steve was going to run through and what it's all about. Wonderful. Thanks, Grace. Warren, can you stop sharing so then I can share? That will be good. There we go. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Warren. Um, shooting from the hip as always, which was, uh, <laughs> that was fantastic. All right. Just right, get thanks, my... Steve. thanks, guys. Um, okay, so everyone can see my screen okay, hopefully, and hear me okay. Let's have a quick yes in the. Uh, okay, thanks, Sheldon. Fantastic. All right. Thanks, Norman. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. Okay, thanks, Barbara. All right, fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Okay, let's let's um let's dive in, shall we? Um, emotional freedom via shadow work. So as Grace said, practical steps to look within and find balance in our chaotic world. And I think this dovetails nicely with um, Warren's manifestation um, protocol and, and what he was talking about in terms of our, our thoughts kind of become things. Because one of the things with the shadow is we, we kind of... Um, we kind of don't know what's there until we look. And so um, there might be some things that I share today that at first you get some resistance around. Um, if that's the case, then um, yeah, that might be a really interesting thing for you to have a look at. So um, let's dive in, shall we? All right, just if you don't know me, because there are a number of new faces on here, here's seven quick things about me. I live on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. Um, I'm a lot like Warren and it's kind of eerily, spookily, um, how our lives um, are intertwined. He lives in Perth. I live in the Sunshine Coast. We are of this, born in the same year. I'm about three and a half weeks older than him. We are basically the same height. We both have four children. We both have a business sense, but also a deep spiritual sense. Uh, we're both deep feelers, deep thinkers. Um, and it goes on and on and on, including our, um, our upbringing is in terms of um, influence under the dark feminine and trying to spend our lives um, to unravel all of that and what it means in ourselves. So um it's it's eerily spooky and people who've been around us long enough well we'll just it's, it's an eye rolling kind of thing oh here they go again kind of thing um i'm a spiritual teacher poet and author oh, i do i do have two personas i guess if i can put it that way i do like warren I, I have a business persona i i show up in the world under my full name or my you know my, my first name my surname of steve Plummer. my full name is steve vincent or stephen vincent Plummer. as a, a poet and an author i write under my first two names of steve vincent so um i'll share with you um the book that i published um earlier this year many of you have a copy i know i'm doing exercise or two from that as well um i, I do love the water and nature i live very close to the beach i live on the water um, I, when in a previous life, I was a, a high school teacher, a high school head of department, deputy principal. And I spent two years right in the middle of Queensland and um, it was a, a really unhappy time for me. And I've only worked out all these years. Uh, well, I say it was an unhappy time. It was a great learning experience. Um, but it was the, the distance from water that really affected me on a spiritual level. Now, I didn't understand it back then. I understand it more now, but it's something that I have to do is to be near water. Um, I'm very much an introvert as well. I much prefer being. Um, you know, not seen, not heard. Um, however, having said that, I can speak. Um, I have spoken to crowds as big as 2000, but I am an introvert. That's where I get my energy. I need my alone time. I need my alone time near water. Um, and again, in a busy, bustling world, working that out for myself about what makes me tick and what gives me energy has been a really interesting process. Um, I'm a deep empath. I, I feel things very deeply. Again, I didn't know that until maybe two or three years ago. Um, and probably the last one is I'm a chronic mistake maker um, and I'm slowly learning, unraveling things from my shadow that it is okay to make mistakes and everything doesn't have to be perfect. Um, I've carried a lot of heavy energy all my life about everything being perfect and being a high achiever and all those sorts of things. Um, and I'm slowly unraveling that and letting that shit go. Um, and I'm a lot happier as a result of that. Um, so yeah, that's me in seven really short bullet points. All right, um, so what we'll cover today, really simply, I'm going to take you through an introduction to, um, to shadow work. I'm going to give you three tools. The first one is the annoying relative and how to deal with them over Christmas. The second one is um, 
obligation on you being the people pleaser and letting that go. And the third one is a wisdom code for manifestation, which dovetails, as I said at the start, really nicely uh, to Warren's. Um, and then lastly, how to keep perspective in these chaotic times, just a, a small little exercise for you. All right, so let's begin. Um, one of my I have a love-hate relationship with him is Dr. David Hawkins. And um, when I say I have a love-hate relationship, his work is brilliant, but I find his work very confronting because he actually exposes a lot of things about myself that I don't want to look at. Um, and he has this map of consciousness and it's available everywhere. I think he first published it in the eye of the eye. Um, I've read just about all of his books, um, Power Versus Force um, and so forth. He's a really great author. Um, if we look at the right-hand side of that, um, you know, we're either in an expanded or a contracted state. And if we go over to the left-hand side, we can see where the energy of love vibrates and where the energy of fear vibrates. And it's no surprise that um, now with all the fear around, you, you'd look at the words in the middle there, the getting by and the suffering. And there is so much just getting by, just surviving, so much suffering going on. And so part of what we are on about today is to give you those tools to move higher up um, that map of consciousness, um, you know, and, and away from that fear and more into love and willingness and acceptance and, and those sorts of things. It often is not easy, um, but hopefully the tools that you live with today will give you new ways of exploring what that means for you and your life and, and all of the influences that, um, you know, that we, we can't ignore or deny exist. They're there and we have to find a way through them. And that's part of our challenge. Um, here to stay in our center and get out of the suffering, get out of the getting by and get more into flow, despite what is going on around us. Um, I love this quote from Ezra Pound, um, a poet, of course, but um, he said, a slave is one who waits for someone to come and free him. And so this, this whole presentation um, today is about you being able to free yourself, you being able to free yourself from the fear, um, because there, there is no one coming to save us um, you know we have to be our own hero and we have to take charge of our sovereignty and be sovereign um, you know within ourselves and the second one I, I just love this and Warren touched on this and we mentioned at the start uh, again that, that millions of people never, never analyze themselves mentally they are mechanical products of the factory of their environment preoccupied with breakfast lunch and dinner working and sleeping and going here and there to be entertained they don't know what or why they are seeking, nor why they never realize complete happiness and lasting satisfaction. By abating self-analysis, people go on being robots conditioned by their environments. True self-analysis is the greatest art of progress. And that's one of the reasons why I believe things are so tough now for many people. Their, their attachment to that robotic existence of getting up Monday, going to work, going to the pub Friday night, et cetera, et cetera, that has been thrown into chaos and that lack of self-analysis and being able to look within and having the uh, I guess the the emotional courage to look within um, you know that's that that has just thrown people and, and so again not to belabor the point but today is very much about tools to help you do that um, famous psychologist Carl Jung he's not the first but he he put it really succinctly about what shadow work is he said that everyone carries a shadow and the less it is embodied in the individual's conscious life, the blacker and denser it is. At all counts, it forms an unconscious snag, thwarting our most well-meant intentions. And I guess basically, if you've got recurring patterns in your life, if you've got um, things that always trip you up, if you've got um, continual thought patterns, thought processes, if people trigger you, if, if something at work keeps triggering you, that means there is something within your field, within your shadow, that you have not looked at. You haven't shined a light on, you haven't loved as part of you. Because here's what I know from my own experience. There are two parts to us as humans, right? The part that we show the world. So all the, the lovely, um, nice things that we show the world. But we also have this other part of us that we shove back into our shadow. So all of our shames, our fears, our embarrassments, our... Um, our pettiness, our, our anger, our envy, our jealousy, and all of those sorts of things. We all want to, we all want acceptance. We all want to feel love. We all want to be loved. And what we think is that if I show those negative parts of myself, then I'm going to be judged harshly and I'm not going to love. And so we shove them back there and pretend 
that we that they don't exist. And I love um, the, the quote by Dr. De Martini. He says that I'm not a nice person. I'm not a, a mean person. I'm a combination of both of those things. And I can only find my balance when I recognize and love those two parts of me. I'm not a nice person. I'm not a mean person. I am both of those things. And yet what we do is we show the world just our niceness and we bury behind us in our shadow, our darkness. And it's that darkness that keeps running our life. He goes on, Carl Jung, he says, knowing your own darkness is the best method for dealing with the darknesses of other people. One does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. The most terrifying thing is to accept oneself completely. Your visions will become clear only when you can look into your own heart. Who looks outside dreams, who looks inside awakes. Now, I'll just give you a really quick example. I mentioned I, I published a book earlier in the year. Um, it's been um, accepted and, and being sold in a number of local bookstores. I, I have a favourite cafe that has a, a lot of crystals. It's one of my favourite places to go and they sell books and things. And um, I, I approached them to, to stock my book and they eventually said no after you know, they gave me a reason. And uh, a couple of weeks after that, um, someone said, oh, let's go to that cafe. And I just said, oh, I don't go there anymore. And they said, what do you mean? And I said, well, they, they're, not, um, they're not accepting my books. I'm not going to go and spend money there. If they're not going to support me, I'm not going to support them. And the person said, well, gee, isn't that just a little bit childish and petty and churlish? And I said, no, it's not a little bit childish, petty or churlish. It's 100% childish, petty and churlish, but I'm happy to own that. And that was what, honestly, I was feeling about it. And I don't judge myself about that. That, honestly, is what I was feeling. Now, the old me from two or three years ago would have put on a smile and asked, yeah, that's okay, that's fine. I would have gone there. I would have been pissed off the whole time. I would have said nothing. I would have been fuming underneath, but putting on a smile. Um, and I was in, in doing that, that is just total dishonesty about how I show up in the world. So I've worked really hard on not doing that. Yeah, I was really petty. Am I a petty person all the time? No, I'm also very generous and giving and loving. But until we accept both parts of ourselves, then the shadow will run our lives. Um, just a couple more things. Alana Fairchild is one of the, the spiritual authors that I, I read a lot of and, and use her, her, her cards and so forth. And she said, it takes courage to connect with your inner world, to go deep into the truth of your pain and to bring love to those wounds so a healing current can transform and free you from the past. It takes maturity to live with depth, to look beyond the surface and refuse to give up your journey. When something difficult is asked of you, it is time to grow. And I actually believe we've been asked difficult things in these times. And so as we said at the very start, this is a wonderful opportunity for all of us to grow. Um, uh, this one, I don't have a, a source to attribute to this one, but it says, honesty will raise your vibration. Truth like surgery may hurt, but it cures. Deceitfulness, on the other hand, will lower your vibration. And when I get back to me being petty, churlish and childish about um, not wanting to spend money at that cafe, um, if I'd have just painted a smile on my face, I would have been deceitful. You know, a lie is like a painkiller. It gives temporary relief, but the side effects will hinder your growth and make you recycle your experiences. And so what would have happened if I had gone to that cafe I would have um, painted on a smile. Everything would have been fine on the surface, the, 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 the part that I showed the world. But then I would have walked away just feeling really crappy about myself, not standing in my truth. And, you know, my, my position was, well, screw them. If they're not going to support me, I'm not spending money on supporting them. And it was really nice and empowering to be truthful like that and being okay with being truthful and with the judgment that came from my friend who just wanted to go there and have a cafe. No, I'm not going. It was simple as that. Um, I saw this the other day and this intrigued me. Um, the secret to change is to focus all your energy, not on fighting the old, but on building the new. And that kind of, I just kind of went, mm, I don't know how well that sits with me because, you know, I'm, I'm a real believer in the importance of shadow work because it's a process, as we've said, of exploring your inner darkness. Um, it uncovers every part of you that has been disowned, repressed and rejected. It's one of the most authentic paths to enlightenment, says uh, Lona Wolf, who I follow on social media. Um, I've got a real problem with, and this is kind of what the love and light movement do. I've got a real problem with focusing all your energy, not on fighting the old, but on building the new. It's kind of like the way I describe it. It's kind of like, 
having rotten wood and just ignoring it and painting over it. You know, the paint will be good for a while, but you can't sustain it because the, the rot will come through. And so I actually reject that outright. I think we actually have to look at the old, the things that have got us to here, the things that are running our, our programming, our minds. And because if we don't deal with those things, then our life is like painting over that, um, you know, that rotten wood. Um, and so I, I love this to you know, just put a little exclamation point on, um, on the explanation for this is anything unresolved within your energy field will keep manifesting itself in our physical, mental, emotional and spiritual life until we heal it. There is no escaping this. Face it, feel it and heal it. And I'll go back to the, the book cafe incident. Um, if I hadn't have stood in my power and acknowledged my pettiness, churliness and owned my, all of those negative things, then the next time that happened, it, I would have just kept getting messages from the universe. So I really believe on, I really believe in the importance of shadow work if we are to stand in our power in these chaotic times. So let's have a look at, um, and let's enter the darkness a little bit if we can. Let's have a look at a few practical examples um, of the shadow. So tool number one for finding your center is the annoying relative. Now I'm sure it's not just me who has an annoying relative. Can I, can I just have a yes in the chat? if you may have one or two annoying relatives or annoying work colleagues that just whatever they do, they just tick you off. They just piss you off all the time. Thank goodness. Thank you, everyone. Linda, Sheldon, Jenny. Good. good. It's, it's not just me. Um, it's not just me. Good. I know that I'm not the, um, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not the only weird one. Um, excellent. We all do. Okay. So let's have a look at how this works because what can often happen, especially around Christmas time, you, you have form, you and your pissed off relative or your annoying relative that pisses you off all the time, you have form, right? So last Christmas, they did X, Y, Z, which really ticked you off. Christmas before they did this, Christmas before they did that. Um, now, I want to say at the start, this is not about accepting bad behavior, but this is about looking what is within your shadow. So you come to Christmas with form, with your, with a history, with a past, with this relative. So let's have a look at what this might look like. Um, there's a wonderful tool uh, used by Martini, I think it is. Um, and it goes like this. The seer, the seeing, the seen are one and the same. You might want to write that one down. The seer, the seeing, the seen are one and the same. And it's a wonderful tool to help you deal with things in your shadow and particular family coming up over Christmas. Here's what it looks like. Um, you know, we all have that annoying relative. Let's just do a scenario here. Her name's Tracy. It could be Wendy or whatever. Let's call her Tracy. Um, <clears throat> and let's be blunt. Tracy is a complete bitch. She is, she is so selfish. She never gets off her ass. Um, she never brings anything to the Christmas function. Every family function is the same. She just sits there and blah, blah, blah. And you've got this whole shopping list of all this woman's very obvious to everyone's really horrible traits. And that ticks you off all the time. You know the sort of person I'm talking about, right? We've all got that. We've all got that person in our lives. Here's the thing though. If we, you know, actually here's the thing. Christmas time, she never even bought anything this time. This year, like last year was a tin of stuff. This year, the bitch never bought anything. Can you believe that? How selfish is she? And you know what? What's even worse, poor old Auntie Doris nearly fell over. She never even got off her ass to go and help her, help her and made sure she was okay. What sort of an awful person is she? Tracy, God, she's such a bitch. I can't stand her. I know it's not just me who has those thoughts, right? We all kind of do. Tracy is really good for our life, though, because of this little tool. The seer, we see selfish. The seeing, we see selfish. And the seeing, we see selfish. And what Tracy is doing, because all of those things are one and the same, she's actually reflecting where is the selfish in me? And I'm just using selfish here as an example. Maybe it's angry, maybe it's rude, maybe it's lazy, whatever it is, whatever we judge her as being deficient in. So where is the selfish in me? Because here's the thing, right? We've got Tracy. We, we're here going, God, she annoys me. She's horrible, blah, 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 blah. Tracy's here. Tracy's got a whole lot of family and friends and work colleagues. They love her. They think she's fantastic. So we've got these two ends of the thing. 
Tracy's in the middle. Tracy hasn't changed. What's changed? It's the person looking at them. And so if all we ever see in Tracy is this selfish bitch, where is the selfish person in me? It mightn't be around family. Is it around work? Is it around some friends? The seer, the seeing, and the seen are one and the same. So all Tracy is doing is reflecting back to us part of our shadow that we have not accepted and loved within ourselves. That's why she keeps ticking us off. The seer, the seeing, and the seen are one and the same. So whenever you get an opportunity or someone else gives you an opportunity by being selfish, angry, whatever it might be, it's a beautiful thing to look at where is that in my shadow that I haven't yet loved, that part of me that I haven't yet loved. Now, people find that confronting. People find that hard to accept. But here's the thing. When you're pointing the finger, you are projecting outwards. You are projecting something outwards. And all that is doing, it's your egoic mind trying to protect you from looking back at yourself. So where is the selfish in me? Or where is the bitch in me? Where is the tight ass in me? Whatever it is that you have judged your relative Tracy, your sister-in-law Tracy, or whoever it is in your life. So <clears throat> do you avoid your shadow or the selfishness in you? You know, I'm not like her. God, she's way worse than I am. That sounds like avoidance. By projecting outwards though onto others, like a relative like Tracy, all we are doing is avoiding that in ourselves. So my, my big question to you, and I, I do love, again, this is a Martini thing. Whatever you resist in your life persists. That's a writer downer as well. Whatever you resist persists. So if Tracy is pissing you off year after year, family gathering after family gathering, what are you resisting at looking at in your own life? That's kind of confronting, right? Because it's so much easier just to point the finger at Tracy. You've got so much evidence to prove that you're right. But if you're seeing it all the time, it's there in you as well. All right, so over to you. Here's just a quick thought. Um, I'm going to be quiet for one minute. What recurring patterns can you identify in your life that you are resisting? It might be around the relative Tracy. It might be around something else. What recurring patterns keep coming up that are a signal that you've got something in your shadow that you haven't yet looked at? I'll be quiet for like 30 seconds. You're free to, you're welcome to um, whack some in the chat. Don't have to. If you feel led to, do so. Okay, Faye has said um, health and money are things that trigger her. Um, yeah, and Barbara said, what if a client has been violent, negative? I mean, it's not about, it's not about accepting shit behavior. If there are boundaries in place, there are boundaries in place. These are more passive kind of things that are, are recurring patterns, right? So just be, just be really clear about that. It's not about your, your boundaries being violated. There, there's a big difference. And that's where that power of discernment comes in. Um, Barbara said around money. Um, Sharon, belief in money is my rights. Um, Sue has, I detest gluttony. That's interesting. Sue, where's gluttony in your life? Really interesting. Fear and doubt. Yeah, where is that in you? Um, Diane, thank you. Um, oh, yeah, Anthony, perfectionism. Hello, I'm a trophy child. I hear you. I feel you. Um, so we look at that. Where is that in you? Um, um, Sharon's also, she detests gluttony. Um, Fiona B, health, money, perfectionism. Real followers annoy me. Fantastic, Sue. Where's the real follower in you? Um, Sheldon, critical of government officials. Where's the critic in you, Sheldon? Um, frustrated when people ask why I am jab free. All right, so where's that projection in you? Faye said about injustice. Fantastic. Um, forming friendships with people who are busy, busy, busy and emotionally unavailable. Okay, how emotionally available are you, Sachi? Um, you know, Faye, where's the injustice in you? Um, communication. All right, fantastic. All right, so we get the idea. Recurring patterns are a really good chance for us to look at where that is in our life. All right, um, let's enter some more darkness. That was a little bit about light. Um, let's, um, 
let's have a look about the people pleaser because I believe this is big for many, many people, at least I know it was for me. So in my book, Finding You, I'll just really quickly tell you, um, it's got 70 poems in it. So I write the poem, I explain what I, what I was thinking when I wrote it, and then there's some reflection exercises afterwards um, for you to reflect on what that's like in your life. And so for today, I've chosen a poem on page 102 called Obligation. And it goes like this. I should, I must, I have to, I'm sorry, please, thank you, I apologise, be good, do the right thing. Maybe I should just be, let go, trust, love, just be. Maybe I should just be and let it all unfold in divine right timing. Yes, the truth, I should just be. And I've written that poem very deliberately. The, the energy at the, the start of it is really, really heavy of all those obligation things. The second part of the poem is very much about the way I actually want to be in life. And if I share with you the, the reflections on page 103, um, here's why I wrote this poem. It says, the honest, real, raw me hates expectations. Doing things just to please others is a mini death sentence because you sub subjugate your needs and free will to someone else's, and that sucks. One day I was feeling pretty crappy after I'd agreed to a request from a friend. I pondered why it's good to give to help others right. As I tapped into the root of my feeling, I realized it was because I didn't want to do it, what I'd agreed to, and had only said yes to be nice. And I wasn't being true to myself. And this made me ponder this insidious force in my life and how it has ruled me for so long. And that was what came out, that poem about obligation. I said, no, the other thing that came out was no more. My obligation is to me. This doesn't make me a bad person. It merely writes the ledger of this lifetime. And here's the interesting thing, right? Um, I'm 53 years of age. I have created lots of career success. As I said, I was a, a deputy principal in a school. So it's not like I'm any kind of wimpy kind of pushover kind of thing. And I know there are many people here who are very successful in, in what they do. And it's not about that outward success. It's about our default position, about obligations to other people and about people-pleasing tendencies that have been put on us from when we were really young in that imprint period. I believe there's a really big thing around religion with this. Um, you know, if, you, if you're not a good person, you go to hell, that kind of thing. That's very much um, still interweaved in the fabric of society and in all of our lives even if we didn't have a really harsh upbringing, harsh religious or a strict religious upbringing, I should say. But the whole notion of that heavy energy at the start, I should, I must, I have to, oh, I'm sorry, please, thank you, I apologise, be good, do the right thing. You know, that's a really heavy energy that is, is, is often very much just shoved down into us from a very early age. And if we don't do those things, then we're not a good person. And in you know, really basic religious kind of stuff, we're going to go to hell. And so I think that's a really heavy energy that, um, you know, that all of us carry to some extent. And so here's, um, here's what I'll share with you the reflections in the book and, and get you to think about what it, is, what it means in your life. And so what I've asked you to do in the book, I ask you to um, move that. I ask you to have a think about obligations because they produce a winner and a loser. I ask you to think about your life and be raw and honest here. I want you to list five obligations that come to you. Now, here's the thing. Don't judge them. Don't judge the other people involved or don't judge yourself. Just list what five obligations are present in your life right now. I'll be quiet while you do that.
Uh, Christina said, interesting and powerful. It's a choice. Barbara, that's why I'm having a quiet Christmas. My choice, not expectations. Absolutely. Um, Sharon, not, not sure what you mean um, by that. Uh, Sue, I was thinking just the same. Here's a lot. Here's a lot for Barbara's comment. Really, expectations for Christmas. Yeah, I mean, do you just go to Christmas because your your family want you to? Because that's what you've always done. Um, you know. Oh gosh, don't, how can how can you do that? How can you not join the family? Well, maybe if you don't like being around them, that's a pretty good one. Um, Faye has said, I've been doing a lot of work around people pleasing. Yeah, Faye, I, I reckon it's a really big one in in a lot of people. At least I, I know it is for me. Um, it's a lifetime pattern of that. You know, Simona said, I should stay in touch with friends. Um, <laughs> that's certainly an obligation, isn't it? Um, you know, and I guess if it's true friendship, you just pick up where you left off, even if it's been two years since you've talked to them. You know, that's that's my view anyway. Um, uh, the obligation around being vaccinated to get your job. Um, Penny has said, it must be the dutiful daughter. Must. Yeah. There's an awful lot of obligation around that, Penny. Thank you for being honest and raw with that. Um, yeah. Minu re responding to my mum's message. Look, oh, I... I can relate to that really, um, really deeply. My mum um, passed away earlier this year. She was in a nursing home for a number of years. And, oh, God, the obligation of seeing her, um, that was really heavy. Um, so I totally, I totally um, resonate with that. Um, Sharon has said, so, no, Marcia has said about getting vaccinated. Sharon has said, I'm rapidly losing my shoulds. Good for you, Sharon. Um, Sue, obliged to return gift cards. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, looking after elderly mum. I hear you. I feel you. Um, Christine, I should be a good caring daughter. Yeah. What sort of what sort of daughter doesn't do that sort of thing? It's, it's that kind of um, that kind of stuff. Being diplomatic, successful, do not ruffle feathers, helpful, um, be what you're expected to be. Anthony, aren't you nice? That's wonderful. Oh, isn't that? It's such a heavy energy, though. Thank you, everyone, for your honesty here. Um, I should only believe the so-called science from Marcia. Um, being a good mother, a good wife, this is from Judith, a good friend, being a reliable person. How lovely, Judith, you're so nice. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's really heavy. It's such a, it's so hard to do all those things. It's so hard to keep up that expectation, right? It's, it's hard, it's heavy. No wonder we're tired. Um, to try and keep contact in contact with my two sisters. Yeah, that's effort. It's, you know, looking after a difficult dad. Yeah, my hear you, Christine. Um, uh, Sue was about gift cards. Okay. Uh, Robin, caring for PSTD, psych patients, ex military, very close family member. Yeah. Uh, Diane, I should be happy this time of year, but it's a difficult time. But I'll be honest with you, I hate Christmas. Thank you for being raw and honest with that. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I've just disliked it my whole life. It's, it's my. <laughs> I'm happy to own that, you know, or maybe I'm just weird. I don't know. I dislike Christmas. There you go. It's on the table. It's out there. Um, Judith said, yeah, I know it's killing me. It's, it's heavy energy, Judith. It really is. Joanna said, I must be nice. I have to keep the family together. I must look after mum. I have to sort this money out. I have to be healthy, blah, blah. Yeah, I'm hearing you, Joanne. That's such hard work. Um, Tim, provide for my family. Yeah, I've got that breadwinner syndrome. At least I had it in a big way. Um, Fiona, B, being responsible, being available all the time. Wow, this is really great stuff, guys. Oh, goodness me. This, oh, um, so this the, the, the hating of Christmas is coming out. Um, yeah, and Sue said Christmas is usually hard for empaths. Um, Sheldon, I'm with you on that. Um, I love Christmas movies and realise that is not so not me. All right. Um, I'll be <laughs> oh, gosh, I've, I've, I've got a... Um, I, do, I have to giggle with this guys so about um, people coming out and saying, yeah, all the Grinches are coming out, more power to the Grinches about how annoying Christmas is. Um, Minu has said she loves Christmas. More power to you, Minu. Um, um, and this is interesting. Penny has said Christmas is like a shadow I have to endure every sodding year. Yeah. Um, all right. This, well, we've got four. That's really hit a nerve. Thank you guys for your comments. I'm, I'm not going to have time to get through those. Um, wow. Um, now I've just asked you to reread your list. Um, what emotions have come up for you? And, and again, maybe just mentally, mentally list them a quick shopping list. When you went through all those things about your obligations, what, what actual emotions came up for you? Because this is really important because this is what you're carrying all the time.
Wow, yeah. Guilt, anger, resentment, guilt, anger, guilt. Yeah. And um, Judith feeling fed up, um, not being authentic. Injustice came up. Um, in, oops, that's moving so quickly. Inauthentic, not being myself, exhaustion. Um, so, you guys, wonderful. Um, anger, heaviness, stress, overwhelm, honesty. I'm not, <laughs> Sharon, not a triathlon. Yeah, I didn't quite get that one. Um, isn't, isn't that a, a really interesting um, exercise, though? Look at all those things that have come up. If we are truthful in ourselves, the Grinch, we don't like Christmas, a lot of us. Some people love it. Great, more power to you. Some people don't. It might have been the first time that anyone out loud, even if it's here, actually admitted that. And also the, ang the, the emotions behind it. And so you can see when we are so tied to obligation because of stuff stuck, stuck back in our shadow, how heavy it is to carry those emotions around with us. No wonder when things like COVID happen that we get bashed all over the place. No wonder that we're tired and exhausted all the time, those heavy emotions that we carry, that we carry with us. All right, so I've said now, this is uh, straight from the book, take back your power now. Choose three obligations um, from your list. Besides each, note how you can change these so you aren't a loser in the interaction anymore. And here's a little, um, here's a little tip. You can just say no. You can put yourself first and just say no. The first time, it's really hard. I felt horrible guilt when I did that. But you can just say no. You can stand in your power and just say no. So I'm going to be quiet for 30 seconds while you choose three obligations and make a note of how you are not going to follow those obligations anymore. All right, again, wonderful. Thank you. Um, thank you for your comments there. A couple of different ones. Um, Penny, she burns the paper crown ceremonially. Um, Barbara says it does get easier. The first time you do it, it's not. It does get easier. Um, Sachi said she's saying no a lot. Um, uh, it's freeing her up. Wonderful. Um, Penny, I tried to say no. Um, maybe that will take a couple of times um, to do that. Um, and Christina said, the good caring daughter establishing limits. And that gets back to that boundaries, right? This is not about ever um, accepting poor behavior from someone else and having your boundaries violated. All right, wonderful, everyone. Thank you. Hopefully that exercise was useful to give you an avenue to look back into those things. The good boy, the good girl, the people please out that is way back there in your shadow that is running your life and help you take back your power. Um, people do ask often, um, where can I get a copy of your book? There it is, www.findingyoubook.com.au um, if you want to order a copy. Um, so just everyone always asks. So there it is. I'm heading that off at the pass, findingyoubook.com.au. Okay, let's um, go into tool number three for finding your center, the wisdom codes. And this actually aligns really closely with what Warren is talking about in manifestation. It's a little bit biblical, but it's also not. Um, I refer here to one of my favorite books by, I'm a bit of a fanboy of Greg Braden. I should stop elevating him, but he, he's one of my favorites. Um, the Wisdom Codes. Um, the reference that we start with here is Exodus 3.14. It goes like this. When I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God your father sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What is his name? The reply is, and this is in Hebrew, Iyah Asha Iyah. And the translation of that is I am that I am. And as Greg explains in the book, there are a couple of different versions of that. I will that I am um, and a couple of others. Um, Greg's, really, Greg's interpretation of this is really interesting. He said, this is not a doctrinal religious thing. He said, but the, what this is, is a proclamation to the energy field about what you want to will into existence. He calls it a power code. And he says it's a power code that obviously has three parts. 
the I am. And he says, I claim to the universal field that the action following this statement is already manifest in a state of existence. Now, I know this is probably in a, in a crowd like this, this is probably not new about, you know, Warren spoke about, you know, your, your vibrations, your thoughts, et cetera, et cetera, you put out into the energy field. But going back into God identifying himself in Exodus, um, I am that I am. Greg is saying his interpretation is this is a way for us to take back our power. And so I am is the first part that is the state of existence is present and sustained. And then the I am, again, is I claim to the universal field that the action in this statement is already manifest. So I am that I am. And, and Wayne, Dr. Wayne Dice has spoken a lot about this when, when he was alive. Um, so Greg goes on to say that the key to the successful use of this tool is simple. Be very clear about what you are choosing to will into existence. Be free of judgment and attachment with respect to the outcome. And he said that modern science has confirmed the universal field is simply a mirror. As Warren said, it honestly reflects the views and beliefs or our thoughts that we hold. And um, he says that being specific and concise are the keys to any successful conversation with the universal field of energy that connects all things. And he says, create a adherence between your heart and your brain, which we did at the very start. And from a place of non-attachment, clearly and concisely say, either silently or out loud, I am, followed by the desired outcome, and then I am. And he said, it's then important to feel the feeling of what it is that you want. So feel the feeling like you've already got it. And then say the words, thank you. He cautions, don't say, I give thanks, but say, thank you, out into the field. And he said, that's a really important distinction. So let's have a go at what that might look like. Um, oops, let me just move that thing. Um, so say either silently or loud to yourself, I am, followed by the desired outcome, and then I am. Feel the feeling of having it, and then say, thank you. So I'll give you an example. If if right now you are feeling um, you're feeling disempowered or you're feeling fearful or you know, maybe you feel like you need strength at this time, it's quite simple. It's I am the strength I need now. I am. That would be that's an example of that proclamation. Feel the feeling of strength like you've already got it and then say thank you out into the universal field. So the whole process is, you know, I would put my my heart my hand on my heart rather into that heart space to coherence of the, the heart and the mind, slow my breathing, whatever it is that I want to bring into my life, I am, whatever it is, the strength that I need now, I am. Feel the feeling and then thank you out into the field. So I'm going to be quiet again for about a minute to let you go through that process because the, the thing in the middle that you want to manifest right now will be different for everyone. So I'm just going to be quiet and let you um, let you sit with that and go through that exercise. All right, so that's um, that's a little tool for you to take and, and you know practice with over the next week, two weeks, um, you know, to, to give you just something else to, um, you know, when when the fear does come up, when the overwhelm comes up, when the exhaustion comes up, 
what were you going to, and again, it aligns very closely with what Warren was saying at the very start. What are you going to send out into the field? And as Warren said, it's a mirror that reflects back you know, with our last thousand thoughts. So I think you've got a couple of um, nice comments there. Simone said, empowering and calming. Okay, Faye said, this is great. Sharon says, that felt amazing. Oh, wonderful. Okay, and um, the last thing I will leave you with, just to wrap it up, is rule number six. Rule number six is, is really important um, because it's so easy in these times to really to really lose our perspective and you know a, a two minute scroll on social media can go from being incredibly calm and centered to being a, a raving lunatic yelling at the world um, you know if you're not careful and so rule number six goes like this um, and it's an important tool to take with you um, over the Christmas break especially when we're around family and stuff. So rule number six goes like this. There are two prime ministers. The one on the left is the home prime minister. The one on the right is the visiting prime minister. And the two prime ministers were in the home prime minister's office discussing the affairs of state. And the discussions were going really well and until all of a sudden, the door to the prime minister, the home prime minister's office burst open and in runs his personal secretary, raving a piece of paper, you know, yelling, red in the face, yelling, prime minister, prime minister, have you seen what the latest cabinet papers have done. And, just, and he said, Mary, he held up, he said, Mary, please remember rule number six. And instantaneously, Mary went from that really angry, red face, waving a piece of paper, wanting blood. She said, oh, of course, Prime Minister, I'm sorry. I'll come back later. He said, thank you, Mary. Um, she left and closed the door and the two Prime Ministers went back to discussing the affairs of state. And the door burst open again and, and in came John, the, the press secretary, and and he was waving a piece of paper. Prime Minister, can you believe what the bloody press is saying now? This is ridiculous. This is going to ruin everyone. And Prime, the Home Prime Minister held his hand up and said, John, please remember rule number six. And instantaneously, Press Secretary John went from being this ranting, raving nutcase to, oh, okay, Prime Minister, thank you. Sorry, I'll, I'll come back later. Thank you, John. And closed the door behind him. The Prime Ministers went back to discussing the affairs of state. It happened a third time. And after the, the door closed the third time, the visiting prime minister, he said, he said, my friend, in, in 25 years of public life, I've never, never seen anything quite as extraordinary as that. He said, tell me, what is rule number six? And the home prime minister, he paused for effect. He smiled and he said, my friend, rule number six is don't take yourself or life too seriously. And the visiting prime minister, he, he nodded and he smiled and he said, oh, my friend, that's a very good rule. He said, tell me, if that's rule number six, what are all the other rules? And the home prime minister, he paused again for effect. He smiled. And he said, my friend, there are no other rules. And if we can remember that in times of stress, in times of heaviness, in times when the energy feels really, really difficult. Remember, rule number six, don't take yourself or life too seriously. That can change the vibration and get us back up the scale um, of Dr. David Hawkins' um, scale of consciousness. And after I tell that story, I normally share a couple of jokes or, or whatnot um, as, as evidence of or proof of, um, you know, it's always good to have a laugh, but I thought today, I wanted to share something a little bit lighter with you or a little bit different at least. I'm not a big art. I don't have art pieces or many art pieces on the wall. I'm not a big art person, but we went and saw the Van Gogh Alive um, presentation a few weeks ago. Um, and when you walk in the, in through, just before you go into it, there's, you know, ceiling and, and floor of, of Van Gogh's Starry Night painting with, you know, fairy lights. And it is just, it is just a sensory I guess, overload and the sensory experience, which is just, it was just, it was just beautiful. It really was. I mean, you know, that's, that starry night and the, the whole, um, the whole presentation, it was just, a, it was, it was awe inspiring, I have to say. And, you know, the, the, there's a painting from the ceiling, another one of his paintings, which was on the ceiling. And then, then you come out through this, def, uh, not daffodils, sunflowers were his favorite flowers. And there's just this sea 
of sunflowers. And, and I guess a, a different take on rule number six here is that despite all of the stuff that's going on out there, you know, it still, it still really helps to find, to find beauty, to find creativity in this world, you know, because there still is much beauty out there. And um, attending that Van Gogh thing, it was a real rule number six, despite all the chaos, despite all the stuff, you know, there is still much beauty to be had in our world. And so that is, that is rule number six. All right, I've got about two minutes. Um, uh, key takeaways for you. What are one or two key learnings from uh, that presentation? One or two key learnings. Just want to whack them in the chat. One or two or three key learnings from um, that little presentation there about emotional freedom through looking at our shadow. Okay, a couple of comments coming in. Um, Faye said she spoke about rule number six last week. Great, Faye. Um, Sachi said, beautiful. Um, Victor, I need to keep tile number six close to me. Yeah, look, we, we all, Victor, it's a really interesting one, right? We all need to, we don't all need to, we all benefit from keeping that in mind because like I said it's so easy to get caught up in the emotion and you know fears are really strong a really strong and heavy um, emotion that is that can be difficult to deal with so yeah rule number six is a big one um, Marcia says um, trust yourself um, Simone Phillips says I can choose calm understand though it's also good Simone um, you know sometimes the the energy needs to be let out somehow and we not judge ourselves either way just if you're choosing calm just make sure you are calm and not putting on a mask of calm because that means that the um you know the energy is still buried in you um now minu is like uh, rule number six um uh, nadina said me too uh christine the heart math um yeah make sure your heart and your head um yeah it's, it's interesting how we're um we're complete for the want of a better term um, when those two things are. Uh, Diana has said rule number six um, and the external mirror. Uh, Joanne, rule number six. Um, yeah, Robin, be watchful of self-imposed obligations. Yeah, uh, obligations, such a heavy energy. Thanks for that one, Robin. Um, Christine, I am that I am. Uh, Seamus has said simple, but also true. Uh, Sharon, dig deeper to see what shadow is still sitting there. Um, Barbara, it's okay to be you. Yeah. <laughs> Diane, <laughs> Diane, thank you for the plug, Diane. Buy the book and read it and do the exercises. Thank you, Diane. That's wonderful. Um, www.findanewbook.com.au. Thank you, Diane, for that. Um, Faye has said, what I see in others is in me. Yeah. yeah and again, that's a, that's a really strong point to bring home when we're triggered by something, the seer, the seeing and the seeing are one and the same. So where is that in me? Where is that in me? Um, Simone has said, be willing to look at everything. Thank you. Um, Sheldon, be truthful. It will raise your vibrations. Yeah, Kat said, love the heart brain exercise to inst instantly change your state from fight flight to healing. Um, Christine has said, tune into the feeling, the I am. Uh, rule number six, <laughs> my next tattoo. <laughs> Good for you, Sue. Um, uh, time frames, uh, Sharon, it depends where you live in WA. Um, some it went really quickly, others it took a couple of weeks. If you're country WA, especially now around Christmas, it will take a little bit of time. Um, I'll use either a courier or Australia Post, whichever one is quickest, I get it to you that way. Um, it could be five days, it could be it could be 10, you know, it just, it does just depend. I have no control over that, unfortunately. Um, Faye has said, facing feeling and healing. The feelings, great, Faye. Barbara, rule number six, the wisdom code. Um, it's okay, I'm okay. Good for you, Penny. Uh, love the I am exercise, says Jenny, rule number six. Uh, Judith said, the seer, the seeing, the seen. Um, being truthful increases your vibration. Deceiving lowers it. Thanks, Sachi. I am that I am. Thanks, Bree. Um, it's great to be able to have the skills. Um, Christine, thank you for that. Kat, it's okay to say no. Absolutely, Kat, say no. 
definitely. If you want to say no, um, Sheldon, is your book available on Amazon? Yes, it is, Sheldon. Um, where's the link? Um, I'm not sure if I can put it in the chat. Can we? Uh, I can. I'll put it in the chat in a second if that's okay when we have a break. Um, I'll be getting according to this. Yes. Um, um, whatever you resist persists. Um, thanks, Victor. I appreciate that. All right, gosh, there's heaps more, heaps more um, um, comments. Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate that. Okay, it's now um, 12.40 or um, 10.40 Perth time, 12.40 Eastern States, 1.40 Daylight Saving in New Zealand, I'm not sure, and um, South Australia, I'm not sure. Um, but um, <clears throat> let's, we're going to take a, a really short break. So thank you, everyone, from me to you. It is Namaste. Um, we will be back on deck at um, 12.50 Queensland time, which is 10.50 WA time. Um, we're just going to take a, a short break to give you time to go to the loo, grab a cup of coffee, a tea, uh, a drink of water, whatever it might be. And um, then we'll hook back in um, with Grace talking about new year, new beginnings. Um, so thanks, everyone. And we'll see you in exactly eight minutes time. Thank you. <laughs> 